Today, Your Money, Your Wealth podcast number 328 is packed. It's a long one. With $6 million in retirement savings and $475,000 gross income, are Roth 401k contributions a good idea? Is filling the tax bracket the best strategy for doing Roth conversions? As a highly compensated employee, Nick's wife in Ohio is having trouble doing a Megatron Roth contribution, and Nick asks if the folks at her company have rocks in their heads. We'll let you decide who's got the rocks in their heads after hearing Joe and Big L's response. Plus, moving a pension to an investment plan complete with a limerick. Jim calling from Santa Cruz wants to know about moving his house to his self-directed IRA, or rather, Jim's brother does. Uh huh. Deborah wants to know if she should refinance her house. Clarification on spousal versus survivor Social Security benefits. And Joe and Big L discuss rolling a whole life insurance policy into a low-cost variable annuity. We'll need more of your money questions, comments, limericks, and stories, so email them in or leave us a voice recording. Visit yourmoneyyourwealth.com and click Ask Joe and Al on air for your spitball analysis on YMYW. I'm producer Andy Last, and here are the hosts of Your Money, Your Wealth, Joe Anderson, CFP, and Big Al Clopine, CPA. Hey, Joe, Big Al. Love, love, love the show. I'm Dan from New York City. Love your great advice, especially done with great humor. I crack up when you start ripping on the questions again. Hysterical. Yeah, Dan, this question sucks. <laughs> <laughs> We're already ripping on the question. <laughs> ah, get to it already. <laughs> but most importantly, I learned so much by applying the answers you give to others to my own situation. Here's some background. Uh, you may need to answer my question. My wife and I earn a combined gross income of $475,000. I'm 63, she's 62. We expect to retire at 65 and 67, respectively. We have $6 million bucks between us in tax-deferred accounts. 401k, deferred comp, 403b. Um, it's all 90% in equities. In after-tax accounts, we have $1.3 million in cash, $150,000 in individual stocks, and $150,000 in a diversified equity mutual fund. Our employers started offering Roth 401ks a few years ago, and we never contributed. Does it make sense to do so now? Thank you. Damn. Uh, yes, Dan. $475,000 of combined income. He's probably maxing out 401ks. Um, let's call it $400,000 of income. Married. What's that? 32% bracket? Or that's 32, 32% goes up to call it 420. So he's in the 32% tax bracket. Um, you're always going to be in a pretty high bracket since you have six million dollars in retirement accounts and tax in you know deferred comp. Six times four is 240,000 plus social security is going to give him about 300,000. Tax rates at 300,000 dollar levels probably going to be at the 28 or 32 percent yeah i guess as of right now it's in the it's in the 24 percent bracket which goes to 329 but don't forget in 2026 we revert back to our old rates which three hundred thousand dollars and if the state tax deduction comes back new york has high taxes they're going to be subject to alternative minimum tax i'm going to say they're going to be in that that bubble where they're paying 35 percent tax that we used to talk about right years ago yeah the altman yeah so so i think that's right or you could also say you know what you're in such a high tax bracket just take the deduction and you know you've got a lot of money you're just gonna have to pay a lot of tax but yeah it's nice to have some diversification because if you're going to be perhaps in the 35 percent bracket with the new rates coming back because of altman uh because of the loss of the state tax deduction and you're paying 32 now, then mathematically that makes sense. But on the other hand, if the state if if the rates stay the same, you'll be in the 24% bracket and may not make as much sense. That's you know, thought. we're not talking about a, a large portion or percentage of his total liquid net worth, right? Correct. He's got about eight million dollars of liquid net worth. You do this for her um, rest of her career and his career. I mean, it's what 150 thousand bucks, maybe if you yeah, totally yeah. max it out, maybe a little bit more than that. Yeah, you're right. And and just, so my, just to have some more diversification would probably be a good idea. The tax rates aren't that much different than what they're going to be. So yeah, I, I guess I'll, I'll buy that. I would do that all day long, Dan. Absolutely. Why not? What the hell? You're not going to miss the taxes anyway that you're paying on the Roth. You're going to have tax-free growth for the rest of your life. You don't have to have a required minimum distribution to that. 
you're probably going to start conversions, you know, and that starts, you roll that into an IRA, start your five-year clock. There's, there's a lot of pros there. Um, Cause he's going to retire in two years, his income. I don't know how much she makes versus him. I'm just assuming they make the same amount of money. Um, you know, then the, the gross income gets cut in half, probably do some conversions to the top of, you know, the 24% tax bracket at that point, he's got plenty of non-qualified and cash assets to live off of until she retires, push out social security until age 70, you know, then you do conversions to both of your age seventies, right. Um, or 72 or maybe even 75, right. It's just because of the, um, the RMD age is, is potentially moving up to 75. So um, I like that plan. Thanks a lot for the question, Dan. Uh, appreciate it. Like your sense of humor as well. Hello, Andy, Joe, big Al. Hope all is well. This is Nick from Ohio. Big fan of the show, especially the outtakes, which I'm sure this rant question will be in. I'm sure. Well, you're, you're kind of pretty high on yourself, Nick from Ohio, <laughs> just kind of coming in hot. He, he well, he's saying he thinks it that it's going to be in the derails instead of uh, being in the actual part of the show. So that could be. I'm a 46 year old driving a 2020 Jeep Grand Cherokee. My wife and I have an Irish center at home. See picture. Oh. Huh. Very cute dog. Now people are yeah, sending yeah. pictures of their dogs. I love it. Yeah, we got like two. Second dog yeah. picture we've got. Yeah. We get pictures of background of their jogs. Like that one guy. Here's here's my walk every day. New York that, City. Yeah. Yeah. I lost like 200 pounds be listening to you guys. <laughs> That's right. I mean, we're a weight loss, yeah. financial planning, tax strategy. Yeah. We, we help people with their health as health, well as their finances. Mental health. Health and their wealth everything we're changing the show it's your wealth and health background my wife is highly compensated employee at a company of around 80 employees her safe harbor 401k allows for after-tax dollar contributions and in-service Roth 401k transfers the summary plan description says you can do as many Roth 401k transfers that you want to from any source all great news at this point sounds like an earlier um um, That's related to something we already answered. Yeah. Come to find out, no one at the company has ever contributed to the after-tax source. Thus, no one has ever done the Roth 401k transfer. Her bonus shows up in March. It's $15,000. Great news. But she was limited on the dollar amount she was allowed to put in the after-tax source to 11000 due to the ADP ACP pre-testing in March and taking into consideration all of the other highly compensated employee sources, including the after-tax portion. Regardless, I did not think Safe Harbor had tests, so she fills out the paperwork to do the Roth 401k transfer of the $11,000, and they say she can only do 60% of the 11000 It's like, come on already! <laughs> it's getting worse and worse. I may be understanding limiting an, an employee on a contribution, even if it's after tax, so you don't fail the test for everyone's sake in preventing over contributions and all the paperwork. However, only letting an employee transfer a limited percentage of her own sources makes no sense to me. SPD says nothing on this. The dollars are already in there. Why does it matter what bucket it's in after you already made the contribution? I want to further the conversation with their company, but she says, leave it alone. Questions. Do the people given these suggestions have rocks in their heads? <laughs> rocks in their heads. Do they have rocks in their heads? Jeez, Nick. If anyone anywhere ever thinks there is something fishy going on with their retirement plan, how would you address this? Thanks again for all the time you all put into the show. Peace. Nick. Hashtag Megatron. He wants to do the Megatron so bad. He's getting he just very hostile with his wife's plan administrator. She's like, Nick, leave it alone. It's not that big of a deal. He's like, no, honey, we got to do the Megatron. <laughs> we got to well, do the super duper backdoor barnyard backdoor Roth. 
we got to do it. Here's my first comment is, and this happens with us too. Sometimes we call 401k companies and ask to transfer this or that or, or in-service withdrawal. And the person says, you can't do that. And we, we know that they can. We generally just said, okay, thank you. Hang up. And then we call back later, get a different representative. <laughs> so that's one, <laughs> that's one choice that, that has sometimes worked for us. Uh, I would say, I don't know anything about this plan, of course, but ADP is a very reputable company. So. No, no, he's talking about the testing. No. I know, but AD, ADP is doing the testing. Due to ADP slash ACP uh, are pre-testing. So I'm, I'm guessing they know what they're doing. <laughs> Here's the issue. This is what I'm seeing. Because remember when we try to do this stupid thing with our plan? Yeah, right. And Paycheck said, you can't do that. Yeah. And, and we said, yes, I mean, we, I mean, we, we, we're a three and a half billion dollar RIA and we have a, a paychecks 401k plan. That just tells you, right. It's like the cobbler's <laughs> kids walks around with no shoes on. Just, well, just, yeah. The, I mean, the other choice you have, well, two other choices. One is ADP is usually kind of the next level, actually next level. No, ADP that stands you, you for something else, Alan. It's, it's like a deferral percentage is ADP and then like a contribution percentage. It's not ADP and paychecks. So there's testing that goes into these 401k plans. It's a safe harbor 401k plan, right? And so she is the only one that is participating in the after-tax accounts. So because of th th there's still testing to use the after-tax component. So smaller employers, I think they have like, right, they have 80 employees. Like we have 80 employees. Right. And the only person, people that would want to use the after-tax component to do the Megatron are people that have discretionary income that can put money in the after-tax accounts, right? Because right. she wants to save um, not 90, I don't know how old Nick is. Nick is younger, I think, right? 46? So like, they want to they want to blast this thing out. They want to do the max 401k contributions and then max out the after tax contributions up to what, fifty four, fifty eight thousand dollars $58,000 and do the conversions. However, she can't do it because she's the only one taking advantage of the after tax component. So it's up to these ADP ACP tests. Like what is the deferred plan? How much is in the plan? What are other people contributing to the plan? So th there's going to be limitations to the amount, even though the plan doc allows it, there's not enough people doing it to allow her to truly maximize the Megatron. Yeah. And, and Andy helped us out. You are right, Joe. ADP stands for accrual deferral percentage has nothing to do with ADP, the payroll company, <laughs> which is what I thought. But right. you, you, you are correct. I mean, in other words, uh, Generally, a safe harbor plan, you don't have to do this kind of testing, but I, I, I think the rules are different for the after tax. Very few plans have them. As you said, Joe, our, our provider says you can't even do it, even though we know you can. So. But here's the deal. It's because it's a small, like Microsoft, right? They have th these large companies that have a lot of participants within the plan, they don't have to go through it because th there's so many more people that are participating, right? Yeah, when you well, only have, to, have 80 yeah, employees, yeah. it's going to be highly skewed to highly compensated people that are taking advantage of the after tax. So they're going to, they're, they're not going to make the full contribution allowable. Yeah. So, I mean, they still have to do the calculation as a larger company, but what you're saying is it, it comes up a little bit less often because you have so many people that are contributing, which may be true. Correct. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Particularly, it depends on the company. Like Microsoft would have a lot of highly paid employees, so that would be true. For other companies, maybe um, I don't know, like a contractor type company with lots of employees and where people are not making that much, you know, that might be different. Right. Um, Qualcomm, for instance. Right. They have the same. If you have a, you want to put after tax monies in, you can convert yep. it right out. No big deal because you got a lot of employees at Qualcomm and there's a lot of employees at Qualcomm that make a lot of money. Right. right? And, they're, and they're all taking advantage of it. So um, these rules were put into place to n not to have, let's say the, the owner of the company um, or, you know, the top people in the company have a big tax shelter by utilizing some of these plans while the, the rank and file 
are not necessarily utilizing the plans, it's like, well, no, then you can't have that big of an advantage, even though you set up the 401k plan. Now you got to set it up as a safe harbor plan. And the safe harbor plan is that, all right, well, the highly compensated person, you could still max the plan out, but you're going to have to match, you know, all the other people you're going to, you're, you're going to have to motivate them and, and have a higher or, or, or better benefit for them contributing into the 401k plan. And then now with the Megatron that we just started this huge craze, everyone wants to go to the big back door after tax and then convert, but smaller employers are still going to be subject to the ADP testing. So that's what he's falling into. Um, and then good thing. It didn't say, um, um, paychecks testing. Cause that would have really, <laughs> that would have really blew you up, Al. It would have, wouldn't it? <laughs> I thought I had it too, but you know, apparently not. <laughs> uh, good I it was okay. I got a great answer. Here. Oh, I got this. I'm killing I the it. game. I got it. I got it oh. Joe. Let me raise my hands. Let me, let me talk. <laughs> <laughs> I just just watching you just I implode. got this nail. I know what ADP is. That's a payroll company, <laughs> which is true. It's just not the right one for you. <laughs> oh, oh gosh, that's awesome. People still write in. Unbelievable. Oh gosh, I uh, got Jr. He writes in from Charlotte, North Carolina. Joe, Big Al, and Andy, love you, Shell. The best I found. I've spent many hours listening to your podcast while I exercise so I can take extra credit for extending my life. All right. Thank you. Uh, QX60 Infinity. Big Al, do you know what that is? Is that a big one? It's a big one. Yeah. It's a SUV. Uh, got and it. he's got a QS50. That's the smallest one they make. The biggest one is 70 or 80, I think. Oh, you so I guess he's I, I guess he's thinking it's not big enough to be manly. Um, I know not the man most manly, but it works. All right. No pets. Uh, like women, they have proven to be more trouble than they're worth. Wow. Sorry, Andy. JR. That's all right, JR. <laughs> JR. Tough road there. Uh, divorce squared. Oh boy. <laughs> So he's all done right. with that. Three, three times the charm, JR. Yep. Come on. No, don't get out of the game just quite yet. Uh, 59, $1.2 million saved for retirement. $500 traditional 401k, 150 traditional raw, uh, rollover IRA, and uh, 10K in a Roth. 540000 in a brokerage account. Uh, own an S Corp with unpredictable income. Total compensation normally is $200,000, uh, but never know for sure. I typically max out $26,000 into my traditional IRA. Uh, here's my question. Well, first of all, he's putting $26,000 into a traditional IRA, Al. Yep. 26 grand in an IRA? Uh, well, he means 401k. I didn't even catch that. He, me he met a 401k, I think. Uh, you, you and JR are tight, huh? You guys talk about <laughs> old <laughs> divorcee stories. I got none of those. Yeah. I was going to say, are you implying that Al is an old divorcee? I don't know. He's been married 32 years. I don't know what he did before that. Uh, 33. I was oh. too young. So <laughs> since I'm still uh, a youngster. Got it. Um, I really want to get more into Roth, but want to stay in the 22 or 24% tax bracket. Don't expect my expenses to be much more than $6,000 a month in retirement, which will happen in about seven to 10 years. Since my income is unpredictable, is it best to continue to do the traditional 401k instead of the Roth 401k? And at the end of the year, do a Roth IRA conversion to fill up the bracket? What is the downside? I know I'm almost as old as Big Al, but I'd like <laughs> to get rid of the IRA rollover so I don't have to worry about the pro rata rule for the back door in the future. Thanks for all your help. If ever in Charlotte, North Carolina, beers on me, Jr. All right, I'll take you up on that, Jr. <laughs> um, all right, so this is a very good question. I like this question, but Jr. He wants to do conversions, Alan. So he wants to get his money out of the traditional IRA, which he has a hundred thousand dollars, hundred fifty thousand dollars in. 
wants to get it on there so we can just start doing that little backdoor raw, which is the town favorite in right. Charlotte. They talk about it all the time, I, I hear. <laughs> um, you think so, huh? Oh, uh, well, I don't know. It seems like everyone loves that here. So what do you think? And then, so he's like, well, well let me do the traditional. Let me go pre-tax $26,000. And then we'll see kind of how I end up because his income's unpredictable. And then I'll figure out, and then I'll just convert to the top of whatever bracket at the end of the year. I love the idea. I think financially speaking, that's probably the best way to do it because you can really get super tight on your numbers. Um, we would absolutely recommend this 100% of the time, um, especially when there was uh, recharacterizations. We would always want our clients to do the pre-tax and then do conversions um, because if you converted too much or something happened along the way, you could always recharacterize any part of the Roth IRA. That is no longer the case. So whatever you convert sticks. So yeah, I like that idea. Um, the what, what do you see as the issue there? What's the downside, Al? Well, I, I, I like the idea too. First of all, I'll agree with you because when you've got uneven income, like in an S corporation, you don't really know what it's going to be till closer to year end. It's best to do traditional and then fill up whatever bracket that you're trying to fill up uh, by doing a Roth conversion at or near year end. It has to be done by December 31st, but let's say come December 5th or 10th, you kind of know what the first 11 months look like and you have a sense of what the last month might look like. So that's probably your best time to convert to try to get to the top of the 22 or 24. Now the 24% bracket for a single taxpayer is 164. Right, so if he's making 200, and he's got a uh, 25, he's got a 13,000, 12,000, call it uh, a, a standard deduction, and he's putting 26,000 into a traditional. So what's that? 30, call it 38, call it 40, easy math. So 200 minus 40 is 160. Uh, he's pretty much just about there. He would only do a $4,000 Roth conversion in that example. And some years when his income is higher, he might do none. And other years when it's lower, he could do a much bigger conversion. But why doesn't he take advantage of um, more pre-tax dollars? He could do that as well, depending on how his income is set up. He's S Corp well, sole proprietor, right? He's got a solo 401k. I'm thinking, right? Does it say sole so uh, he's got an S corp. I'm just assuming he doesn't yeah. have employees. So, yes. Okay. So good point. So so here's the question: Do you have employees or not? Right. And if you don't if you don't have employees, then what you really ought to be doing is um, doing the profit sharing component on it. And a two hundred thousand dollars salary at twenty five percent, right? That's fifty grand that you could put in pre you know a pre tax pre get a deduction. And then you could do another $50,000 Roth conversion. So that would make potentially a lot of sense, right? But if he's, if he's got employees and, uh, and then it's, if it's a safe harbor uh, 401k, then if he did a 25% profit share for him, he'd have to do a 25% profit share to every other employee. And he, he probably doesn't want to do that. Correct. So JR, I guess it look to see if, if you're so prop, because we see this quite a bit, is that, all right, they set up a solo 401k for themselves. Uh, they're an S-Corp, they set up an S-Corp, LLC, whatever, and but they don't realize that they have the ability to save a lot more pre-tax, or they could mitch, um, um, what is it, um, what, what mix, am I trying to say? Mix and match. Mix and match, thank you. Yes. Uh, mix and match some of the Roth and uh, the pre-tax, just to, to, to kind of even out your tax bracket there. The, the one thing, it depends, um, and this guy's a saver, right, Jr. Even he, he's been divorced twice, Al. And he's twice. still got 1.2 million. That's that's very well, maybe he's maybe he's getting money from the ex spouses. Right? <laughs> maybe. Right? Maybe um, he married well. Both of them did. I don't know. No, they didn't marry very well because they're, they're he's divorced twice. Squared. <laughs> um, squared. But still, usually when you see divorcees, I mean they're hurting because half of their asses got split either way. You know, it either went to the male right. or the female. It doesn't necessarily matter. Um, but he looks like a pretty good saver. So one of the things that we see is that we would recommend going the Roth 401k versus converting is that it's easier to pay the tax that way. True. Because, because when you convert at the end of the year, let's say you convert 10 grand, $20,000, 
now you're adding $20,000 that the taxes weren't withheld from that throughout. So you're going to have to come up with some money in April. That's right. And But the downside is if you really wanted a traditional, you can't undo it because your tax bracket's too high. So that's the downside. Correct. So, I mean, there, there's, there's pros and cons, right? So if your tax bracket's too high, um, and then let's say you're doing the Roth 401k, and all of a sudden at the end of the year, you get a big bonus. Now you're in the 32 or 36% tax bracket. It's like, well, I probably should have done pre-tax this year versus the Roth. You can't undo that. Right. So that's why going the traditional way is that, all right, well, I know I'm going to get the tax deduction, but then I can always convert and get the same amount of money into the Roth. The downside of doing that strategy is that you just have to come up with the tax money in April, which is not that big of a deal. But for some people that are not necessarily disciplined or they don't have any non-qualified assets to do the conversion to pay the tax, they could run into, uh, I guess, a couple of different roadblocks there. Yeah, I agree with that. So he's got 540000 in the brokerage account. So that should work out all right. And I should say, or we should say, that the maximum you can put into a 401k, any combination of your own contributions plus the company is 58,000. And when you're over 15 older, it's 64,500. So in my example of $200,000 of profits, $50,000 is the employee contribution. Just realize when you add your own contribution with the employee contribution, it can't be more than 64,500 when you're 50 and older. So there you go, JR. Some, there's some stuff to, to noodle on. Um, so I guess the, the, the biggest question is, if he has employees, uh, keep doing what you're doing. I like the, the, the rip out the, the IRA, convert that at the end of the year, get to the top of whatever bracket that you feel comfortable with. And then you can do the back doors if you like later on. Find out more about getting tax-free growth for life on your retirement investments by downloading the Ultimate Guide to Roth IRAs from the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. It's free, and it'll tell you all about the differences between Roth conversions and contributions, traditional IRA, Roth IRA, and Roth 401k, and much more. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your podcast app to go to the show notes and start downloading. Now, that said, if you're really serious about making the most of your retirement dollars, schedule a no-cost, no-obligation financial assessment with a certified financial planner professional on Joe and Big Al's team at Pure Financial Advisors. Click the Get an Assessment button in the podcast show notes now to schedule yours. Uh, got Brandon writes in Fort Myers, Florida, Alan. I emailed the show before. I guess my question was a bore. I thought it'd be funny. I need help with my money. Now maybe Alan Joe won't ignore. Wow. I checked. I could not find any previous emails from Brandon. So not sure what happened. It got lost in cyberspace or something. Brandon, we didn't get it. We answered questions here on your money or wealth. We don't keep people behind. It's like, you know, if someone gets shot. We don't leave them behind. We grab them, pick them up. We put them in the helicopter. Just trying to figure out where you were going with that. <laughs> Watching a lot of sure either. But anyway, Brandon did write us a, a nice limerick, right? Which seems to be a, a common theme of our show. I don't know. We, we didn't ask for limericks, but they, they keep coming. <laughs> uh, another format of poem that we'll start getting. Uh, Joe, Big Al, thanks for all your podcast advice. I really enjoy listening to the show. During my evening walks, I don't own a dog. My wife and I are both 46. I am the main breadwinner. Combined, we'll have substantial retirement savings at my age, 55. My wife's a school teacher with a fully vested pension. She is currently in year 21 out of 30. Her pension increases exponentially over the next nine years. In other words, if she quits now, she would only receive $3,400 per year versus $13,800 annually with seven more years of work or $22,400 annually if she completes the entire 30 years. The Florida retirement system has a provision that allows for a one-time decision to move her pension to an investment plan. If we decide to take a lump sum distribution, which I intended on doing down the road, she would have to be in the investment plan to do this. I'm very leery on the information on the state website because I know deep down, they want people to stay in the pension plan. He knows this deep down. He, he just has a gut feeling. <laughs> he does have a gut. Yeah. You know, he's, he's thinking big, big brother wants to keep the money. <laughs> <Yeah. Right? laughs> That's what he's thinking. 
See the options below that they are indicating with the assumption that she will retire after 30 years of service at age 55. All right. Pension plan annual benefit of 27,468. So, all right. So that's option one. Take the annual benefit of 27,468 when she retires at age 55. If you elect to enroll in the investment plan now, the estimated starting balance would be 130,000. She's 46, so she's going to retire in 10 years. In 10 years, she's going to get, call it $30,000 for life, or she can roll now $150,000 into the investment plan. The $30,000 in 10 years from now is no longer, but she'll have one hundred thirty. dollars Call it in 10 years from now, she'll have, I don't know, a little under $300,000. Yeah, just double it, two sixty dollars ish 300 good enough. Okay, I'm rounding now, rounding. I, I, I get it. Got it. it I'm just it, giving giving some colors to how you got there. Got it. <laughs> Thank you for that color. <laughs> if you elect to enroll in the investment plan now, then terminate employment at 55 and start receiving benefit at age 55, the future value of your investment plan is estimated to be 244000 Oh, well, we did that just kind of back in the envelope. Yeah, I got 260 You got 300 Rounded up. All right. So they're, 250 is what they're going to get. Yep, if yep. you elect to stay in the pension plan for the next nine years, and then just prior to leaving employment at age 55, change the investment plan, your estimated lump sum on the investment plan would be approximately 377000 Okay. I don't understand how a pension plan is estimated to gain $133,000 more than the investment plan over the same nine-year period. Pension plans are highly regulated and typically don't earn more than 5 to 7%. The investment plan assumption above 244 is based on a default age-based retirement fund. I could obviously choose more riskier, higher-performing mutual funds and probably come out better than 244000 But even with a top-performing mutual fund, I don't see how I can get to 377000 They are estimating if we stay in the pension until the last minute. What am I missing here? Thanks a bunch. Well, what's, what is Brandon missing here? Is it a magical rate of return that the state of Florida school system has? Did they got a little Warren Buffett there managing the money? Yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's concerned about Big Brother, I think. So he's trying to figure out what their angle is. Well, because he's saying if, 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 he, if he takes it out now, he's going to get 250000 if he takes a target date fund. If he keeps it in the plan, it's going to be 377000 so he's taking the delta of the 350 versus or 250 versus 377. It's like, I don't get it. What's the math? What are they doing? The pension plan can't necessarily grow that much more than I could do on my own. So what's the secret? What are they doing? The answer is, Brandon, is that there's mortality credits or something that has to be involved here because it, it, it is a pension plan that is a pooled plan for many people, right? This is a guess. I have no idea. I'm just guessing. <laughs> wow. I was thinking, I don't know how to answer that one. You came up with something that sounded really good. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a better BS than you, Al. <laughs> but, yeah. but I mean, this is, this is logical to me, right? Yeah. That, that, is that, that is the, right. So some people live a long time. Some people die. Some people take the lump sum. And so let's say if I take a survivor, if I take, I deserve $25,000 a year, right? I'm going to take the pension. And my boy, Brandon, that we forgot to, to answer his question before, his wife is going to take the lump sum. And we're the same age, and boom, I take $25,000 pension, single life, only me. And I die the next day. I get struck by lightning down in Florida playing golf, right? So what, the, the, where does the rest of the money go? They owe me 25000 but I selected single life payment, right? I didn't select a joint life. I didn't select a period certain to make sure that it pays my beneficiaries out for the next 10 or 20 years. I picked a single life. I died. Where does all of my payments go? It well, goes back in the kitty, goes back in the pool, right? It's sure. not going to get paid out because that was my election. Right. It, it is a pension plan that you can elect to say a single life, joint with rights to survivor, uh, joint with rights to survivor with period certain. There's all sorts of different 
types of ways that you can claim a pension income payment. And some people want the biggest bang for their buck, and so they take a single life. If I took joint with rights of survivor, and if I died and it went to a beneficiary, it's not going to be $30,000. It would be something lower than that because it's based on two lives. So the annual benefit of 30, I die prematurely. That money goes back in the kitty. That is then distributed out to the other pension holders. That's why they're able to have a higher benefit if you hold on to that plan. I am not working at the state of Florida. I don't know what they're doing in that. And I could be completely off base, but that is my best guess. If we're, we don't give advice anyway here, we're just True. shooting the, you know, you know what? We uh, spitballing is what we call it. So I don't know anything about this plan either. And every plan's different. So it's hard even for me to speculate, but I would say the, you know, one of the basic considerations on taking a lump sum versus the pension is, is exactly what you said. If you take the pension, well, then it's guaranteed for life. And that's a pretty good thing, particularly if you live a long life. But if you live a short life, you didn't really get much of anything. And if you took a single life, as you just mentioned, your spouse or your kids would be out of luck. On the other hand, if you take the lump sum, you know, you live long or short, the money is still there, right? But but there's there's reasons to take the take the the pension, you know, sometimes the pension payouts are pretty good. Sometimes they're indexed for inflation. Sometimes people are not very good at having a lump sum. They want to spend it. If that's you, maybe a pension is better. So there's different considerations, but the math on how they come up with all this, that's very plan specific. I, I don't know in this case. I think I nailed it. <laughs> it's possible. Hello, Andy, Alan, Joe, Jim here from Santa Cruz calling again. It's been like six long days since my last email. Kind of sounds like I'm going to a confession. I've got something somewhat different for you today. You guys always laugh at the questions that begin with, my brother has a problem. Um, when you don't know darn well that there is no brother, the message writer was the problem. Well, this time it's actually true. <laughs> BS. Jim from we're, we're not Santa Cruz. <laughs> but he, no, he had to like puff this thing up. Oh, you know, and, oh, but this time, seriously. <laughs> it's real. Well, it's, it's one of, it's always one of two things. It's either the person or the person writing the questions an advisor and they want to know how to what to tell their client. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, uh, my married brother lives in Utah. About 10 years ago, he bought a house in Nevada paying about two hundred thousand dollars. The home has provided steady rental income for a decade. It's now worth about $400,000, and my brother plans to make it his permanent home in retirement. However, the home is part of a self-directed IRA. The money used to buy the home has never been taxed. If not executed carefully, this situation would seem to have some brutal tax consequences. Uh, the first question, could he legally move into the house if it remains part of a self-directed IRA? Uh, no. Yeah, the answer is no. Well, he, <laughs> he could legally, but then it's fully taxable. Day one, personal use, it becomes the 400000 is a tax consequence and fully taxable at that point. Yes. you got to stay far, far away from that. You can't even look at the house if it's in the self -directed. You can't, you can't right. even, I mean, if you look at the regulations, some would say you can't even do repairs. You need to hire someone to come in and do repairs. You can't even mow license. your own yard. <laughs> <laughs> right you can't even pick weeds out of the sidewalk uh, if he can and he does and he dies could the house be transferred into a qualified tax deferred account owned by his wife no well, you guys he can't, he can't live he can't, in yeah. the house it's yeah so that's becomes moot that question but however if it's remained a rental property they didn't move into the house the house is still in the ira and then yes he could um uh, she would be the beneficiary and yeah. she could move the that that ira into her name no problem yeah true i presume the value of the house would be included in his annual rmd calculations correct uh no if he moves into the house it's 100 percent taxable the day he moves into the house if he keeps right. it as a rental, then the, yes. the valuation would be included in his RMD. Correct. If he cannot, and he has to take the house out of the self-directed self -directed. 
Um, that would seem to be a taxable event, correct? Big yes, Al, you must time. be loving this question. Are you loving this question, Al? Big time. I got the same answer four times in a row. <laughs> Can't do it. Can't do it. Can't do it. Can't do it. Fully taxable. That was easy. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was good. Uh, let's see. How, how, how do we get around this thing? Um, let's see. Um, no. I can't think of a way out. That's yeah. You got to You got to live in another home. <laughs> yeah. <My> brother, <laughs> but you know, Jim, yeah. you know, it's you. <laughs> um, I, so the, the house is worth 400,000. You pay 200,000. I wonder what the, the self-directed IRA is worth or what's the total IRA worth. You could cash out that portion, right? You just get the house out, pay the $400,000 ordinary income tax and live in the house. That's, that's a, a pretty expensive that's a, house. That's a brutal tax consequence. As Jim it would cost them $600,000 to move into the house or it would cost <laughs> them 200,000 taxes. Right. Yeah, correct. Right. So uh, might as well just buy another house. It's probably yeah. nicer. <laughs> that's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because I have $600,000 home. Same thing. <laughs> live, live happily ever after. <laughs> Oh, God. We got Deborah writes in. Hi, Joe, Alan, Andy. I enjoy listening to your show and appreciate the information. Until recently, I didn't own a car. <sighs> didn't own a car. Walked or rode my bike to work, which didn't happen this last year since I've been working from home. I just inherited 1995 Celica, which is the same age as my youngest daughter. Oh, oh cool. All right. Recently, my bank has sent us a rate reduction off our mortgage. Uh, we live in California, so we have a jumbo loan, although we just paid it down. Um, so it's now under the jumbo limit. Yay. <laughs> our rate was 4% and the rate reduction would bring us down to 3%. There's limited paperwork, no appraisal, no credit check. The fee is 950 bucks. We are 11 years into the loan and the offer says, that it would retain the same term as my existing loan. However, recently after my last daughter finished college, we began making extra payments, which meant our actual term has been reduced by two years. I plan on paying the same mortgage payment as if the loan rate had never been modified. Is this a good option? There are lower rates, but this avoids the hassles and the expenses of a refi. Our house is worth one and a half million. We owe 585,000. Thanks for your advice. What do you think, Al? So she, uh, she could I, buy I, down a rate for $950 yeah, I, at 1%. I'd do it. I, I mean, it simple, simple, easy. I, I, the math is not that hard. So if you're saving 1%, you multiply that by your loan amount. So that would be $5,850 interest saved. So basically she pays 950 one time to pay to save about almost six thousand dollars a year that, that's kind of a no-brainer the only i think part of the question though is should she do this because it's simple or should she go the route of do, doing a full refinance you know which is finding the best lender going through the credit check going through the appraisal signing a whole bunch of paperwork me personally i like the easy option this is i mean saving almost six thousand dollars a year just by signing a couple forms yeah i would do that Yep. yep, yep, me too. Uh, quick and easy, bada boom, bada bing. Uh, she, she could probably maybe get a, a, a lower rate because she's under the jumbo limits now and all this other stuff, but I wouldn't make it as complicated as it needs to be. You save six grand, pay 950. There you go. Pay the yeah. same extra you know, payment that you are. You have this thing paid off in no time. Have you seen the Your Money, Your Wealth TV episode on getting real about real estate and retirement? Check that out along with Big L's video on the topic of owning real estate in your IRA in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Investing in real estate and retirement can be very lucrative, and there are many ways to do it, but you got to make sure you don't screw it up. Big Al loves to talk about real estate and doesn't get to do it anywhere near enough. So if you've got a question about rental properties, your primary residence, or any other money question for that matter, click the link 
link in the description of today's episode in your podcast app to go to the show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. You can access all of our free resources and you can ask Joe and Big Al on air. Uh, we got Dave from Arizona writes in. Uh, Joe, Al, Andy, love the show. Thanks for the great info. My question today is regarding when to take Social Security. My wife is 10 years older than me. We are still several years away, but I was using the open Social Security calculator on opensocialsecurity.com <laughs> recently and identified that the best strategy based on our present value calculation is for my wife to take Social Security at age 70 and for me to take Social Security at age 62. For reference, we both have about the same number of working years and our expected primary insurance amount are about the same at full retirement. If she outlives me, then no issues as she will continue to take her max from age 70 on. However, the calculator seems to be lacking in its ability to approximately calculate a scenario whereby, for example, I take my Social Security at 62 and my wife takes hers at 70 and then my wife passes away, heaven forbid, when I'm 63. Oh, man. See how I'm building up the excitement here, Al? <laughs> it's, it's crazy. I'm just on, the, on pins and needles. <laughs> Uh, we're making social security fun here, bro. Uh, in this scenario, how are survivor benefits calculated related to my reduced primary insurance amount? Because I took it at age 62. The calculator seems to imply that I would continue to receive my reduced age 62 PIA benefit plus a survivor benefit that would combine top up to equal the full benefit that my wife was receiving before she passed away. Won't the survivor benefit for me be reduced if I'm only 63 and I haven't yet full reached full retirement age? Or does it really top up to my wife's full PIA benefit regardless of my age as, as long as I'm over 60? I'm worried okay. that if something happened to her between the time that I am 62 and my full retirement age, the calculator's recommendations are not correct. And I will thus be subject to taking my reduced ongoing benefit and a reduced survivor's benefit in perpetuity. I'm very leery of taking Social Security at age 62 due to the reduced benefit and would prefer to wait till at least 67 to avoid the situation that I described. Thanks in advance and look forward to hearing your feedback. Love the show. All right. So the scenario is he got on a calculator wife's older, wife takes it at age 70. The difference between taking it at age, let's say, full retirement age and age 70 is about, what is it, like 130% increase. Um, yeah, you get an 8% right. delayed retirement credit each year that you wait. So there's a difference between a survivor benefit and a spousal benefit. Yeah, I think he's got those mixed up. So a spousal benefit is that you could claim half of your spouse's benefit um, as long as your spouse is claiming a benefit, right? So let's say she claims her benefit at age 70. He turns age 62 uh, before he could just claim a spousal benefit, which would be half of her benefit at age 67 or 66, whatever her full retirement age is, but with a penalty because he took it at age 62. However, if that was he, the old rule. <laughs> that was the old rule. Now it's called what deemed. The if he deeming. takes it at the, 62, she's taking it at 70. Rule. It's going to take yep. a look to say, Hey, you take the spouse benefit or your benefit or both. It's going to, um, it gets complicated, but what's the rules on a survivor benefit, Alan? Yeah. Survivor is completely different. You get, you get the, your, your benefit or your spouse's, the deceased spouse's benefit, whichever is higher without regard to when you took yours. So it's completely different rules. So the calculator appears to be right in this case. So he takes his at 62. She takes hers at 70. Her age 70 benefit is a lot larger than his age 62 benefit. Wait, so right. what he's thinking is that, oh, God forbid she passes away. Right. He claimed his benefit early. He's going to be penalized for life or in perpetuity. Right. In perpetuity, Al. <laughs> That's a long time, Jim. <laughs> That's a very long time. <laughs> and so he's like, I don't want to be cut with this lower benefit. I want to just wait until age 67. But if 
he takes his benefit at 62. She takes hers at age 70. She dies. He takes a higher of the two. That, yeah, that's right. It's not reduced. So he takes the higher of the two. So Joe, I would say generally, I, I like this strategy given Dave's situation with maybe one exception. And that is if both Dave and his wife believe they have exceptionally long life expectancy, they probably would do better both to wait till 70. But of course, you, you, don't, you don't know. <laughs> that, that would be a, a, a reason why Dave might wait longer. But in, in terms of hedging your bets, um, having, and, and I guess they had about the same number of working years and same salary. So it's the benefits about the same. So, so generally, we, we like to say that the, the spouse that has the higher benefit, you wait as long as you can. Uh, to collect in this case age 70 is the longest and then the second part is the the spouse that's the oldest and in this case the wife uh i mean they, they both have roughly the same income but the spouse is older so yeah i i, I agree with the strategy unless they both feel like they have long life expectancy then they might want to rethink yeah uh, i would have to look at the numbers but i i think this is the right strategy to be honest because she's probably going to outlive them anyway well, she, but I'm saying if she lives to 100, and he lives to 100, and he lives to 90, yeah, or, or whatever, she, right, yeah, right, 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 right. Then, then, in other words, he's going to do better waiting for his benefit at age because by age 82, 81, 82 is where the break even is. That, that's all I'm saying. Here, here's a couple of other things to so, Dave, to answer your question, what you need to understand is that there's two rules in regards to a survivor benefit and spousal benefits. You're getting those two things confused. So survivor benefit, you're, if she passes, you're going to receive what her benefit was. So the larger benefit that she took at age 70 will be your benefit. You lose your benefit, right? So it goes to two benefits to one benefit. Because of that fact alone, they're saying the surviving spouse will get the higher of the two because you lose a benefit. So that's the whole strategy of, of Social Security planning is that you're looking at, all right, well, let's maximize at least one person's because if they die prematurely or the other spouse dies, someone's always going to have that larger benefit. That is a survivor benefit. So are you worried about death? That's it. 62, you claim it. I get it. You might live a little bit longer, but if you do the math, it might kind of run out. And let's say at age 95, you probably get a little bit more money out of the system. But then you have to look at other planning. You know, what, what's your tax situation look like? Do you actually need the income? Does it make sense to push the income out? Because then you get a lot higher guaranteed income where you can live off of some of the other brokerage or retirement assets. Maybe you do Roth IRA conversions. Arizona, I'm not sure how Social Security is taxed in Arizona. If it's tax favored like it is in California, it might make sense to have a larger guaranteed income for the rest of you and your spouse's life while you live off of other assets. So looking at the calculator will show you what's the most that you're getting out of the system, but it doesn't tell you how to maximize your overall net worth or cash flow. Yeah, Would you agree with that? I agree with that. I mean, it, it gives you an idea of, of uh, I mean, it doesn't really get into your health and uh, and other income. <laughs> and you're right. Sometimes people take Social Security so early, they not only have a reduced benefit, but now their income is too high to do Roth conversions in years where it would have made sense to do a lot of Roth conversions. So yeah, you got it. There's a lot of factors that go over and above a calculator. I agree. Yeah. Um, Arizona does not tax Social Security benefits. So that's another reason potentially to, to push that thing out. So uh, all right, Dave from Arizona, appreciate your uh, question. Let's see, AJ, he writes in, I'm currently in a whole life insurance policy, which I was somewhat tricked into buying. Tricked, Al. Yeah. I put yeah. <laughs> in about $35,000 into the policy in premiums. The cash value of the policy is $25,000. So he's put in thirty-five. dollars Cash value is twenty-five. Yep. So there's a $10,000 loss. I wanted to maintain the loss. I was told I could probably go into a really low cost annuity like Fidelity's. What's your opinion about getting out of this whole life insurance policy, uh, which I don't need? What should I move the money to or roll it over to so that I can maximize um, or minimize taxes or maximize the loss? Um, okay. He's got a hundred thousand dollar loss in a life insurance contract. He thinks that what he wants to 
write this loss off on some other game. Yeah, I think it's what ten thousand, right? Yeah, what I say, hundred. Okay, ten thousand. So, yeah, so so a, a loss of this type. So let's say he were to cash it out, and he gets twenty five thousand dollars, and he put thirty five thousand into it. So there's a loss of ten thousand. That used to be a miscellaneous itemized deduction. That's where you got to take it, which is no more. <laughs> Those are gone. So right. essentially, it's a non deductible loss. So then he's like, all right, well, let me put it into a, a variable annuity so I could carry over the basis is what he wants to do. So I'm going to move the $25,000 into a variable annuity, but I want to see the basis is $35,000, even though it's only worth $25,000. I'm like, why uh, do you want to do this? It doesn't make any sense at all to me because a, it, it's not an ordinary loss. It's a miscellaneous loss that you can't even write off. If you, uh, I just told the guy blow out. Get the get yeah, rid yeah. of the life insurance. Don't move yeah. it into an annuity because here's what's going to happen if he moves it into the a low cost, non qualifying annuity. It goes to twenty five, right? So he's going to wait until it reaches age, you know, to thirty five, and then what is he going to do? Cash it out then and not pay any tax? Well, why are you waiting? Just get it out now into a brokerage account because maybe what? Because the twenty five grows to thirty five, he's going to have to pay capital gains. Is that maybe his, his rationale? Is that what he's thinking? I think I, so. But you can tax manage the non-qualified account, have it liquid, because you can't cash out of the variable annuity until you're 59 and a half. That's the biggest issue. I don't know how old AJ is, but I'm guessing if he's younger than 59 and a half, blow out of the insurance, get rid of it now, put it into a brokerage account. If he's anywhere younger than 55 it doesn't make any sense to put it into the annuity because it's going to sit in the annuity till he turns 59 and a half and let's say it's 30 years from now 20 years from now well now this 25 grand turned to 50 grand turned to a hundred thousand dollars well he's got a thirty five thousand dollar basis but sixty five thousand dollars of growth is going to come out and it's taxed at ordinary income Right. Instead of capital gain, Instead which is of what would gains. happen if he gets it out. 100%, Joe. That's exactly what I do. I just cash out of it and do something else. All right. Thanks for the question, AJ. Do you want to read this one from Mike from Virginia? You can read Mike. You can read Eric. There's, yeah, all we have at this point is, is comments and limericks. So, <laughs> As always. We've only, one, we've only had one limerick, so we should do Mike's anyway. Always enjoy the show while I exercise. Thank you. Mike from Virginia driving a 2017 hybrid Highlander or 66 convertible Mustang. Yes, I'm of a certain age. Uh, there once was a lady from Nantucket who used a strategy called bucket. Best in my opinion, not so humble. If you disagree, let's rumble and, and tell opponents to suck it <laughs> all right okay is that when we were um like ripping on the the bucket strategy probably oh, mike bucket. seems to be saying he thinks that the uh bucket strategy is the best best in my that's opinion what, not so humble that's what he's if you disagree let's rumble <laughs> okay let's let's go yeah mike. we probably we probably talked about buckets and money at some point Actually, I don't mind the strategy. I, I didn't like the way it was being implemented by the firm that came up with it, but strategy is oh. okay. All right. Thank you for your show. Great advice. In spite of the apparent and humorous repetition, I found your comments on 401ks and mega backdoor Roths useful as my employer just made them available. I wonder if it's ADP. <laughs> <laughs> If it's ADP, send it. I, I got that nailed. <laughs> I heard you like limericks and was inspired to write one after your recent show. Uh, okay. Uh, there are two hosts from Diego, which happens to be north of Del Fuego. Don't ask about Roths. Buy and hold like a sloth, and you retire with a nice Winnebago. Eh, I like I that. Like that. That's <laughs> yeah. Eric from San uh, Sacramento, uh, which is also north of San Diego and Orange County. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, we've actually, Joe, you and I have been to Sacramento together. So we know yes. exactly where that is. 
Yes, together. We rode a plane. Yes, we did. We sat next to each other and everything. We did. <laughs> yeah, um, I, we've been to Sacramento together. We've been to New York together. We've been to Minnesota, Minnesota together. The fun just keeps going. <laughs> it does. It just it never <laughs> stops. <laughs> Uh, all right, last one of the day here. Hi, Andy. It's Chris from Austin, Texas, fully COVID vaccinated now and making plans to start hitting them, hitting up those food trucks again. Uh, and whatever benefits that might bring. I got to listen to the 321 a couple of weeks ago. What's the 321? I think he's talking about episode 321. That's I got to listen number. to, you know, the 321. I mean, that's just, I mean, people are just throwing out our episode numbers now. Yeah, you listen to 322? Oh, you mean YMYW? You got it. Right. A couple of weeks ago, and it just dawned on me how rude that I never thanked you, Big Al, and the Joe for answering my question. Yes, they cleared it up for me, and I've not awakened in the middle of the night in fear since, after I digested it all. I never thought that I'd be looking for the next episode of Financial Questions and Answers, as I do with YMYW, but it's addictive even with the light but hilarious abuse that we all get from exposing ourselves with questions. You all keep bringing, you all keep being you and stay safe. Happy trails, Chris. Yeah, well, you know what you get here at Your Money, Your Wealth, folks. And we truly appreciate all the one-star ratings that you give me each and every week. (laughs) You just just need to have thick skin. Then you're good. (laughs) Got to make it light. Finance is serious. It it makes it more fun for everyone else, doesn't it? Yeah. Al and I have been doing this for many, many years. Al, a lot more than me. (laughs) But when you get the same question over and over and over again, it's like, all right, we got to mix this thing up. We got to shake it up. Yeah, we do. Got to take this from a different approach. Yeah. That that way you and I both look forward to it instead of. Dreading. Kind of dreading. <laughs> dreading. I have to no. say, it does seem like the listeners actually do enjoy the abuse because, you know, when Joe starts saying, I don't want to ever answer another Roth question again, they give you all sorts of questions on other topics. It's great. It was wonderful. I really appreciate everyone out there for doing that. We had interesting ones, uh, but maybe next time, ADP, uh, just, just address that to me. <laughs> no, you can address it to me. I've learned my lesson. <laughs> I, I don't make the same mistake twice, usually. <laughs> oh, yeah. So we're getting up in the rankings now because of, or we're moving down in the rankings because these star ratings and everything else. Oh, are we? Yeah. We're getting yeah. worse ratings. Yeah. I, I'm not, I'm not paying attention. Andy to can't sleep at night because she's like, Joe, we got to turn this ship around. <laughs> so we're trying. Are we, at, are we out of the top 100? Uh, right this second, I think we are. But, you know, okay. it doesn't take much to get back up there. What does it take? Does it take like it, it takes some The more you abuse moves? people, the higher we go up in uh, the top 200. Got it. All right. Well, keep your questions coming in, folks. We appreciate your listenership. Um, yeah, we'll keep them coming. See you next time. The show's called Your Money or Well. My four fingers, Celsius and color in the derails of this very long episode of Your Money, Your Wealth. Click Ask Joe and Al in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com to record or email your money questions, comments, suggestions, and stories. Your Money, Your Wealth is presented by Pure Financial Advisors. Click the Get an Assessment button in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com or call 888-994-6257 to schedule your free financial assessment assessment video call. Pure Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full and informed investment decision. Uh, what do we got for time? Four minutes. Like four, four. Oh. Look at you, Big Al. You're on top of it. I saw Andy's four fingers up. I oh. that's what it meant. <laughs> I, I thought she was flicking me off four times. Like, well, do she that? Did that too. <laughs> uh, I just inherited 1995 Celica. Is that right? Yeah. Well, I, I think that's the yeah, intention. That's what she meant. She said Celsius, <laughs> which sounds like you take something you take when you have a bad stomach. Celsius. <laughs> in, yes. in Australia, they pronounce it Celica. Celica. 
Mm-hmm. Anyway, I think I think she meant ninety five Toyota Celica. Got it. Have you ever had Celsius? It's a it's a degree of uh, temperature measure. No, it's a little energy drink. Got it. Yep. A little pre workout for you, Al. When you yeah, run up and down your stairs inside your house with your socks yeah, right. on, to get, my, pound, to get my steps in, it just pound a couple Celsius. That's how I, that's how I train for my big hikes. Gave <laughs> 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 away all my secrets. <laughs> I just inherited 1995 Celica. Yeah. Thank you for that color. <laughs> I like that word. Can you provide some more color? We've heard that a lot lately in the last couple of years. <laughs> Tell me how you think about this. Can you have some more color? <laughs> how many times have we got that question? Oh, God, too many. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Oh, yeah, if that's you... always the response, even when it's not very interesting. <laughs> you know, they weren't listening when you say that. Oh, that's very interesting. What did I just say? I don't know. <laughs> Oh, God. 